Hello and welcome to the Business Environment Assessment Walkthrough. Uh, this is the AAT assessment number one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through this, this assessment really and we'll discuss all the questions and, and approaches and see how we go about it really, in terms of a strategy. So what you're going to see in this assessment is we've got eight different questions in there. So we're going to go through and see how it, how it sort of breaks down. We've got uh, business types and the financial function. Uh, and so another finance function kind of thing here. So we've got a lot of sort of finance function things going on here. Corporate social responsibility and ethics. Ethics, not really as featured as, as much as I would have thought it would have done, but um, could have done a bit more really. Um, in there, but still it's fair whack, fair whack in there. Then we've got uh, a lot of things in terms of the introduction to bookkeeping controls and the principles of bookkeeping controls units. So those those two units are these these two questions here, and also this digital accounting system sits within uh, introduction to bookkeeping controls. What I would say is that as a key thing here, um, is that I don't think the traditional books really sort of set up uh, what these questions are. So I we'll sort of see that in a minute, and they certainly don't set up the digital accounting systems. There's not really much much in those in those books for that that particular one. Um, they were probably written. Um, before the examiner's assessments came out, um, and you know, there's a timing thing that's, that's available for, for that. You know, they've, got, they've got to get their books out um, much earlier. Uh, and so I don't think that they have really the amount of digital accounting systems that the examiner is really going to go for in the exams uh, beyond, you know, they just tend to just have a sort of set of bullet points of what's in the syllabus. And what we'll see in here uh, is that the book that I've sort of produced which has the digital accounting systems chapters in there and then it floods it throughout uh, throughout the books as well really comes into its own in this question uh, where you have your know, marks for any other sensible things that you sort of provide uh, and a lot more explanations about what, what's going on as well so um, examiner keeps doing this in the in the uh, practice assessments keeps putting in digital accounting systems a lot really I'm gonna be interested to see how that turns out then in the in the actual exams for people because um, we'll sort of see how this isn't the easiest easiest exam to start with really and so if this then is on added on as well for 10 marks and it's, it's got low score in there then that, that could be a bit of a and then we got some law and we got some uh, tax and economics essentially so some kind of business environment going on with, with some, some law so let's look at a role of our, our approach to how we're going to do it well we got 32 marks in this one for introduction to bookkeeping controls and principles of bookkeeping controls units and they are the proper accountancy elements of of those two units really so we've got proper sort of day books and uh, you know, going through in terms of reconciliations and uh, errors uh, in fixing correction of errors so the harder elements are the bit introduction to bookkeeping controls and principles of bookkeeping units and so Really, I do quite. I'm pretty quite happy in terms of the way in which I've sort of set up the books uh, that I write in here, which very much focus on the business entity concept as, as a starting point. Produce much more sort of formalised uh, you know, accountancy in terms of local entity bookkeeping in the introduction of bookkeeping controls approach, or introduction of bookkeeping. Sorry, and then the principles of bookkeeping controls has a terrible pass rate, 70% last year, uh, really for uh, for that unit. Which is weird because it's an incredibly easy unit, really. Exactly the same questions, asked in exactly the same way. There's only like nine of them. Um, the examiner might sort of change the wording around a little bit or whatever, but the actual approach to the questions is, is exactly the same. And the only one that's a bit of a memory test and it's payment, payment methods. Uh, so, really, um, what happens is that actually, I think the other books are just badly written for principles of bookkeeping and controls. Uh, so really that one there, if you are finding that you struggle and you've got bad, you know, double, you know, weak in terms of double entry bookkeeping and you don't really know what's going on with the principles of bookkeeping controls um, and you don't want to suffer in this in this exam because you, you will, um, you know, there's the playlist and there's the books available for, for that one. You might need to go back to, to first principles really. If you use dead click, you might not like that, like this, like this, uh, this assessment. Um, if you use the balance method of assets minus liabilities equals capital, you, know, you won't like that either because you want have property accounts. Um, Ten marks for the digital accounting systems. Um, I think it's chapter 16 in the in the, in the book uh, for introduction of bookkeeping controls um, that I provide on that one, which provides a lot more detail than on that thing. The examiner seems to really like this. It's come up in you know I've done like the walkthrough of the introduction of bookkeeping controls one and then this one as well keeps coming up, uh, keeps liking to ask questions on it. Ask the same kind of thing as well as sort of advantages of, of digital accounting systems. Um, you know, and, and this one's quite nice because you write and you can get additional marks for sensible answers. And so I put, you know, this is what the examiner thinks and this is all the additional stuff in reality as well. So you got like, you can score, you know, five out of 11 rather than five out of six or whatever uh, in that one. Four marks in this paper, 
totally subjective, could go either way, still can't uh, sort of, you know, I think it's the way in which the examiner writes sometimes and the way in which, you know, almost a little bit in terms of the more if you operate at a higher level then, then you might actually struggle sometimes with some of the some of the answers because you go well no actually in real life you do this um so just roll with it actually i'm quite, quite pleased because i felt in the business business uh the business awareness one at level three it was more subjective really um in certain instances so fine just roll with it four marks could go either way a bit 50 50 and you know just ask me what it is now in this paper, you are going to need to be able to write, and you'll be able to need to write like an accountant. And so there'll be a bit of top and tailing of certain things like, uh, you know, how do you start a letter, how do you end a letter? That's fine. That's just sort of straightforward in the, in the book. I sort of, you know, and I write it out in, in, in here, and give the explanations as well. Um, shortly, you'll find it entertaining. Um, but also in terms of students really struggled how to write and how to get going and then how to hoover up the marks now i do a detailed um you know, video on on how to write as an accountant always watch that one that'll really sort of help in terms of the whole of it but essentially you'll see as i go through it's state the state what's what the position is in terms of make the statement you know it is this or whatever explain what this means and then extend it to its what the outcome of that is you can then make recommendations and whatever but that's how you gain the full marks and so not only in this playlist do i sort of say what the answer is but i explain how you go are about moving up the marks and getting the answer when you need to get going uh, on you know when you're answering something that's slightly different as a question 35 marks are new areas that require memorizing rules and theories or sort of law and law and economics and whatever. And so, you know, try and make that entertaining when, in, the, in the new book that will come out when it comes out. That's the approach uh, that, that we're going to go through. Now you're going to sort of see the questions and let's get going with task one. Task one. So this is about business, different business types and their functions. So let's just go through it. Um, so identify which is the following statements about the entity concept are, are true and false. So this is the business entity concept that we're sort of trying to, trying to have in here. Uh, so financial accounts can only be about one entity at a time. And so that's false because our financial accounts could cover a more than one entry. It could be group accounts. So we could have group accounts here. Uh, so we'll have you know, group accounts. That's where you know, we have a, sort of a, a, a holding company or, or the main company. And then it has little sort of subsidiaries and whatever. So that one's going to be false. So that one there is false for that one. Each transaction is treated as an entity in its own right. No, that's each transaction is within an entity. So you can have an entity could have a load of different transactions. So you know the entity is the, the company itself, really. And and within that that box of the company is its assets and the things that it owns, and its liabilities and its and its uh, amounts to shareholders. Uh, so nope, that's false as well. The business activity should be kept separate to those from the owners, and that is the point of the business entity concept. Is that we have, you know, as I sort of we go right the way back to the first, uh, the first chapter of the first book that I write in uh, Introduction to Bookkeeping. And the company is a box. Uh, inside the company goes the company's assets. Outside the company is the liabilities to non-shareholders, liabilities, and also as well the liabilities to shareholders. Shareholders are separate uh, from from the company, and they and the company owes the money. That's why. Uh, you know, amounts owed to shareholders of credits because it's negative money to them. Okay, and uh, and really that that is you know, really it's, it's this last one here that is the business entity concept. The business activities should be kept separate from the owners. You know that the owners are separate to the company. Right. Identify whether the following statements about business ownership are true or false. Okay. As there are two owners, they can only operate as partnership. No, they couldn't. They could be. Uh, that's going to be false. That's they could be a. Um, and they could be a, a company and with two just two shareholders so no that's that's false um profits do not have to be equally shared in a partnership yeah that's true you know we could decide you and i could be in partnership let's say over the book um you know i write the book you do the proofreading okay you get 10 percent. i get 90 percent um so uh in terms of profits do not have to be equally shared uh, shared equally in a partnership um so do not yeah that's 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 true if they set up a partnership and want to expand the business, they can only do this if they sh if they should share. No, that's 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 false uh, as well. So, and uh, that's a false one. Um, you know, we could you know take out a loan between ourselves. We could you know each put a house up for sale or whatever it is there, or sell a car and put something like that, or put it all on our credit cards. Um, right. Your friends have decided to set up a limited company and asked you some questions about what records they need to keep. Ooh, okay. Identify which of the following statements is correct about their records. 
uh, they must complete a paper copy of their tax returns. No, 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 um, tax returns now are digital. Uh, if they make a loss, they do not need to file this financial statements. Oh, oh yes, they do. Uh, so they would need to still file their financial statements if they make a loss. In fact, that's important about the financial statements because somebody who's reading them wants to see that you know they're making a loss, and you know this person's making a loss, and therefore I'm not really going to give them any cre any credit. And then, so it's going to be the last one then. All their accounting records can be stored in the cloud. They could be stored in the cloud if they would choose to. Um, and what that means really is that we've decided to have uh, some kind of uh, third party do our our accounting software and we're going to store our, our accounting records in you know in, in basically in, in some kind of massive server somewhere in there um, which comes off of this uh, this accounting system really in here so uh, it's not that we decided to sort of uh, you know put it outside to dry and then it goes up into a cloud um, it goes into uh, you know, basically this sort of third party hosting uh, thing who's doing our doing our accounting software for us it doesn't mean that it's not like just disappears out into the ether it's in a massive data bank somewhere uh your service somewhere else um you know in some kind of old nuclear bomb bunker or whatever um identify which function of of the business uh, the following the following statements relate to so which function of the business the following statements relate to okay all right so this is going to be right well which 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 function is going to make sure you know, in, in our functions finance function hr1 um whatever are going to make sure that, that uh, we, we've got enough um of whatever it's required so ensure that there's enough money so we're going to provide the money finance is going to provide the money uh, to purchase the raw materials so that one will be finance uh, safely satisfy customers needs in the most profitable way so the people who deal with the customers are sales and they will be trying to make profit so that's going to be the sales team that sales and marketing team are going to satisfy the customers need in the most profitable way improving customer service skills so so these people are going to improve the skills and then, so they're going to do training and hr does the training so this one last one here was about actually about uh, functions within the within the organization and really. um, functions within the organization is a question it's always a bit a bit um it's always a bit open to debate this one really in here fortunately this one was quite straightforward really and we'll see later on and uh, that there's a big weakness within this this uh, this unit's assessment really but it, a lot of things can be taken as a matter of opinion but in terms of what are the functions of the finance department first one you know uh, to produce and to attain the capital at the cheapest price possible so that's what they've got to do you know, we've, we've found money so if you see ensure that there's enough money find money uh, secure money that's going to be the finance department. It's put in raw materials in here to try and see whether the purchasing department sort of gets sl slotted in here, but you know they, they not actually need to find the money to buy the purchase of the raw materials. The purchasing department is just going to find, you're going to, going to just buy them. Uh, see if you satisfy customers' needs. So this is customer needs here. That's what the sales department do. You know they sell and they consider the profit. And then training. Whenever you see a sort of a training, improvement customer skills, that kind of training, uh, secure um, staffing. Uh, discipline staffing keep them all motivated whatever that's HR so that's the end of that question question one uh, it's about the finance function okay so we're going to see a finance function question um, originally quoted and asked us for a particular individual who's asked to join your organization as an AT trainee so we're going to see some some sort of straightforward or you know, simple questions uh, sometimes in here uh, but it's a finance function question so we might see some sort of um, ropey sort of things that we just have to roll with so uh, identify who's responsible for each of the following tasks. That's really quite a nice, straightforward question. Uh, so, preparing the financial statements. So, let's just go through who the, who the individual characters are then. So, the internal auditors they check um, whether companies are compliant with uh, their proceeds, you know, their, their procedures and their, their systems. Really, do they follow their their, their approach? And the other thing as well that internal auditors tend to do as well is. We might have some specialists, specialist knowledge, and they might sort of be able to sort of tell us whether whether we're, we're complying, let's say, with some funding rules, something like that. So that's what the internal auditors tend to do. The owners of the business, so they own the business, they're going to sort of uh, they're going to approve accounts. They might they might uh, you know, sort of um, uh, agree the appointment of directors, that kind of thing. Uh, external auditors, so they're going to review the financial statements and they're going to provide an opinion about whether the financial statements are true and fair. Uh, they might also as well you wouldn't do this at, at AAT level two but you know, they might, might also um, provide uh, statements on things like regularity of how, whether the funds have been used in a regular and appropriate way but mainly true and fair audit opinion so preparing the financial statements is the finance director so that's the finance director left off in that one so that the answer to that one is the finance director
Okay. And signing the audit certificate for the financial statements. So as I said, we've got two sets of auditors here. Internal are going to check the you know whether compliance with, with systems, notes, and procedures, um, and they're also as well going to provide some specialist knowledge. But they're not going to they're going to provide a sign, sign off on the financial statements. That is the external auditors. They're going to provide a, 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 an opinion about whether the statements are true and fair, subject to some of the limitations. The external auditors could rely on the internal auditors' work on on sort of systems notes to affect their risk. That's a theoretical position. In reality, all external auditors follow substantive, substantive audits, and it's because it's just more cost effective, really, rather than, rather than checking the, the risk and doing systems audits. Um, systems audits is just something that I used to do, sort of, um, you know. Sort of, God, 20, 28 years ago, and they died. And they, they, unfortunately, they died a death back then. Uh, so that one is going to be the external mortars. So a systems note, a systems audit to, to reduce risk and therefore reduce the amount of substantive testing is a theoretical concept that doesn't really sort of doesn't really sort of have a place in, in, in a modern auditing point of view. But you might see it later on um, at higher levels when you're doing audit. Okay, so identify which group will require the following information. Okay, so we've got here, and this is where these sort of questions start to break down a little bit, really. Um, but we just have to roll with it. As a general thing, if you're if you're struggling to work out which one's which, then I'll think about the most bean counter kind of uh, answer, and that will be the one for AAT. Uh, so overtime payments, and the HR would actually have an interest in overtime payments because they'll want to see that people are um, you know not working too many hours. So they won't go in over 48 hours a week. And also as well, you know, if somebody's doing, let's say, 50 hours a week or whatever of overtime, uh, you'd have to question the quality of that, that work really when they're getting uh, driven uh, into the ground. You'd be better off employing another person really than having two people that would be, um, would be there. One, one in terms of their, their freshness and how well they're, they're approaching it, and also two in terms of, the, um, in terms of how reliant we're on a particular staff member. So although in reality it's the human resources department, that doesn't sound like a bean counter question or answer to me, so let's, let's leave that one alone for the moment. Payroll department will need that to process the payroll, and uh, so that will be the answer uh, here, because that's very bean country. And HMRC, HMRC couldn't care less really whether it was overtime, whether it was normal, they're just interested in the, in the total payments. And so that one's going to be the payroll department, even though in real life, the HR department has a big uh, increase. And you can identify which group, it's sort of saying which one um, in here, really, and you're sort of like just going to tick one, really, it wouldn't, it's those two. But that's the way, that's the way this, 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 is, this assessment rolls, I'm afraid. You just have to roll with it. As I said, if in doubt, pick the most bean counter answer. So, let's go. Customer accounts that have exceeded their credit limit. All right, so the production department's not going to be interested about customer accounts. The production department just makes things. HMRC couldn't give a monkey's either. Um, it's just looking in terms of whether something makes a, you know, the organization makes a profit for it to be able to tax it. Uh, or whether it makes sales to be able to tax it. Uh, here, it's going to be the sales department. And the reason why is because we would block customers. They've exceeded their sale at their credit limit, they're not having any more. The sales department stops selling to those people until either we decide to increase their credit limit or they pay their bill. Okay. Right, identify which department will make use of information supplied by the finance function. So this is going to be very much be a role with a question, because again, we've got this sort of thing where we're making a statement, it's going to be one or the other. Uh, even though you can always make an argument for hmm, so let's go. The costs of goods returned. Okay. Now in reality. The warehouse uh, department will need this this information because they'll need it to, be able to work out stock figures. But the real the ones that really wouldn't need this more it would be the production department. And the reason why is now, let's say we got uh, we're supplying we're, we're dealing with a supplier and they're giving us loads and loads of faulty goods. And as a consequence, our production line is stopping. So our production line stopping, everything's all grinding to a halt. And we've got two things that we can do here. Either our production line stopped. You know, we just have to go to wait for another another supply uh, to turn up uh, that's actually not faulty, and that's cost us a fortune. Or alternatively, we're having to carry a load of stock uh, than we really want to do uh, because you know the, we can't really rely on you know the, the, the products that we're being given. So we're having to sort of make sure that we don't stop our production line. We're having to carry you know, twice as much stock as we need to uh, because of you know we don't know which bit's faulty or not. Really, we can't just stop our production line. So it is production here in this one. Even though you could very much say, well, you know, the, the, the warehouse department needs to know um, the cost of goods returned because they need to uh, reduce, re adjust their stock uh, figures. That's why this is a bad question. 
the cost of faulty materials returned to the seller. Okay, so in this one here, um, the buyer was 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 this one up here. So this one's where we should go back up to here. This one was where we were the buyer, and really it should have been the cost of goods returned by the buyer. That top one there. This one's the cost of goods returned to the seller. So yeah, I mean it's faulty materials returned to the seller, and so really you know well would the production department want to sort of have a hand in this one because there's the you know our sellers are return their goods the production department is, is producing a lot of rubbish um really it's very interesting or very important for the production department um but let's look what, what's the most bean counter question answer we can have well the warehouse department is going to have to have to record uh, the the uh, materials returned from the seller or oh, well, returned to the seller uh, so cost of faulty materials returned to the, to the seller. We're gonna the answer is warehouse in here, right? And this is cost of goods returned here, cost of faulty materials returned here. Same thing. Uh, one's production, one's warehouse, according to AAT. The reality is, is both are interested. You just have to roll with it. And that's just that. IT char technology charges for the stock management system. Well, that is the warehouse. Production doesn't give a monkeys about that, really. The warehouse, um, you know, I think it needs to know how much its, its, stock, its uh, stock control system is costing us, really. Is it, you know, really cheap and therefore, you know, might not be giving us the answers that we want? Is it really expensive and we don't really need it? Um, so that one is going to be important for the warehouse. There. So if you're looking at this question here, you know, well, Look, there's one of one of one mark that we're certain. There's two marks, frankly, that you could answer in either direction, and either direction would be right or wrong in this one here. So it's 50-50 on that one. So in this thing here, you know, you could end up with a third of the marks. And this is the problem with, with this assessment that you have to sort of roll with these kind of things and just not get cut up about it. And then later on we're gonna to have to score hundred percent and things like the written ones. And where students fail is because they're sort of a bit, a bit weak on, on written questions and a bit weak on the on the double entry bookkeeping so they're not getting 100% and those those sections really here and then this kind of stuff comes in and finishes them off so yeah not a great question that one really um i've put the answers there but frankly these two i i would have gone production production and um, warehouse if it was me personally but um you know you could argue you could argue uh, one way or the other right Aisha's asked you for help with planning her workload. She's confided in you that she's struggling to meet her deadlines. This is where we're starting to get the sort of um, things here, and we're going to we're going to prioritise our our work here. And if we're going to prioritise, we have important and urgent. We have not important and urgent. We have um, important but not urgent. And then we have not important and not urgent. Ooh. So you drop them in there, number one, number two, number three, number four. And we're going to sort of fit them, fit them through. Uh, she's asked to provide some important urgent information for a meeting at 11.30. She's going to fit that, that in and it's going to take an hour. Okay, so um, she has to deal with her emails right, right up front. So she has to do her emails right up front. And that takes her from, uh, what is it, 9 to 10. Okay. So she has to do that, 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 though, because it's sort of telling us um, that's what she has to do at the start of the day. And uh, she's then got to have her, she's got to do her important thing, hasn't she? Um, so she's going to provide the information. She has to do that, 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 um, between 10. 10 and 11.30. Ooh, that's the hour and a half we got there. And she has a lunch break for an hour. I wasn't sure we should have got a fit somewhere in there, but she's some, uh, so she's, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, she's got a meeting between 11 and she, it takes her an hour, doesn't it? That's about, yeah, one hour. That goes, that goes 10 to 11, sorry. And that's 10 to 11. She's then going to crack on with something else. So what's she going to do next? Uh, well, she can't do the, the payment run until after the invoices. So she's going to process her invoices next, isn't she? Processing 
choices. And that's going to be now 11 till 12. Okay. And then she's got her cover desk and lunch. And that is 12 till 2. 12 till 2. Okay. Now, in terms of the rest of her day, um, well, we've done the invoices. Uh, so we're going to prepare that we, we would come back at lunch and we would prepare the payment run. We actually have to keep doing this, but you know, let's just see what it works. She would do. She'd be doing that between 2 and 3 p.m. And then there's emails at the end, isn't there? Emails. So that's 4 to 5. Right, okay. Oh. 4 to 5 p.m. Alright, so that's, that's the day there, really. Completely full day, no gaps, whatever in there. So that's that's how it would look. We don't really have these ones after the after the lunch time, but that's how it would be. Really so what you do is you, you drop them into those different boxes in here, so we can see uh, this was um, important and urgent done at nine to ten. This was important and urgent done there. Then this was um, well, sort of not urgent. It's important, not urgent in here, and there was nothing urgent after that. We just had to get it, get it all, fit it all in, really, wasn't it? All, all those ones where were were in there. In the sort of important but not urgent in terms of that, and um, that's how we do it, right? Uh, so we fill down that, and this thing in here. So what else does she have? Right, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I chopped off the off the rest of the answer. Right. Okay. So what happens then is Aisha's getting a bit stressed out about the whole of um, of uh, her, you know, because if you look at this this timing here, and it's running, there's no gap whatsoever in terms of that thing. There, it's all got to it all be fitted in. So I'm just getting really concerned about that. What should she do? So should she should she throw a sickie? No, never throw a sickie. That would be no bad idea. Uh, should you? So what advice am I going to do? throw a sickie? No, absolutely not. Uh, stay late and finish the task. In reality, always you know, stay late and suck it up. Um, speak to a line manager and explain she needs help to finish all her attacks. That's that's the answer there, isn't it? You know, that's the sort of the the, the HR answer, which is what we would go through in here. So I'll speak to a line manager and explain she needs help to finish all of her tasks. Actually, she doesn't. She just needs to get on with the work, really, and, and it all fits in. Fits in there. Um, stay late and finish the task. Um, you know, would have perhaps been my my answer to be honest with you in real life, um, because you know, seems to fit, fit perfectly well. Um, right, and so let's identify whether the following statements about the use of technology within the financial function are true or false. Staff in the financial function should never use information collected from the website as a not reliable source of data. So, um, well, not really. No, I mean you would you would use something. I mean it's it, it's yeah. You, know, you might it might. It might not be the most reliable source of data, but it's certainly got some reliable rel there. Um, useful information can be collected um, using mobile phone apps. So yeah, you can you could collect things using mobile phone apps if you wanted to. So that would be false and true. Strange question, really. Um, but but there we are. Um, and that's the bit where you went through with this kind of thing. In reality, how do these sort of um, questions sort of work in this in this assessment? They're all a bit a bit sort of ambiguous really aren't they so staff in the financial function should never use information and when you see should never um unless you're sort of staff in the finance, finance function should never steal from the company um it's always sort of highlighting to you a little bit of a red flag in terms of should never um and so you know that's obviously a false there and then the use of information can be collected using mobile apps well yeah of course it can um so that is the end of that question Right, so task three. Uh, this task is about corporate social responsibility. So, um, you know, profit being an important motive for companies, but not the only motive. Uh, ethics, which is you know your your, your sort of five ethics that out within the uh, within your you know code of code of ethics and sustainability things like carbon you know, carbon footprint. Uh, so let's get on with this one. So identify whether the following statements about corporate, corporate social responsibility are true or false. It is only concerned with activities that benefit society. Um, no, I mean it's important that the, the, the activities will benefit society, but we might actually have other things like we might make make money um, from from some of the CFR CSR activities. So let's say uh, we reduce our carbon footprint, uh, which would be good. 
uh, but it might actually be cheaper in terms of we're not using as much energy. So you know we might replace our LED lights, uh, which you know will reduce our carbon footprint and be you know corporate social responsibility. We might, might replace our sort of lights with LED lights uh, because we're reducing our energy costs. So it's sort of save. Let's say we go from a, you know, a T5 light to a to an LED light. Uh, probably we'll have a payback period of about 18 to 18 months to you know two years probably a lot less now actually given that the increases in, in electricity prices probably now dropped into like 12 months um you know that's going to save us a fortune so you know when you go out around sort of uh, public sector buildings like you know, uh, schools or or hospitals or whatever and you see the amount of light that gets burnt off uh, from there you know we could just replace all of that that, that and we'll save a fortune uh, so yeah it will have some activities that benefit society and they are important uh, some things are going to be very much about you know saving money, like like reduction in energy costs. Some things um, they might have a nice greeny washing effect in terms of let's say the electric car scheme, uh, but really is a good way to get a cheap Tesla if you're in the private sector uh, and you're the finance director. Um, check it out. Uh, it involves all individuals in the company taking responsibility for actions. So normally when you see these words like only concerned and, and all all you know you should be red flags appearing here at this point I think, you know, this is probably a false one but you know, actually in this instance here corporate social responsibility is about all individuals in the company taking responsibility for their actions you know everybody has to sort of be part of it you can't have this the ceo sort of saying let's reduce our energy costs and then the estate director just doesn't do anything with the with the reduction of, of, of energy costs because then it's just you know just talking about it so that one's actually true so false there for the first one true for the second one should only be undertaken to improve customer perception it's important you know and customer perception is important you know we can't go down chopping down amazon rainforests anymore um or you know it's a bit unpopular if we sort of um you know invest in uh, tobacco let's say or guns uh, but it's not only the only thing really uh, now um because you know, as i just highlighted we could we could save some money in terms of costs like i think we might make, make, make more money um if we are corporate and socially responsible so good for brand but not the only thing really anymore sometimes we can actually make make savings identify which stakeholders we've got some stakeholders here uh, the following statements relate to and whether they're internal or external stakeholders. So these stakeholders are most interested in profit, and they're going to be the owners. You know, the owners, are, the owners own, you know, the shareholders uh, own the business. Uh, so the shareholders own the own the business, you know, and they, and they want to make money out of, the, out of owning the owning the business. You know, they might they might um, be you know, interested as well in terms of some ethical sort of sides, in terms of if this company can do do good things as well, whatever. And they might be concerned if the company's doing bad things, uh, but mainly you know, the owners of the company are there. And they are um, interested in profit. You know, if they were just interested because they wanted, you know, thought the company was great, whatever, they might be a customer. Let's say that kind of thing. Uh, but they are the owners would be there. Now, in terms of here, internal or external stakeholders. Internal or external stakeholders. In, internal stakeholders includes the shareholders in in, in this instance really here. Uh, so they'll be internal. So the internal stakeholders are going to be things like managers, staff members, and shareholders. External is going to be customers and the government and that and, and job wider. You know, let's say the community. Um, so the internal ones here, although it goes against the business entity concept. Um, you know, then they're, they're going to be uh, they're going to be the stake the shareholders are going to be internal in, in, in this instance. Uh, these stakeholders can offer high incentives to persuade a business to locate to the area. So the people who are offer offer incentives, uh, oh, sorry, can offer incentive uh, to the business to relocate to areas of high unemployment. Uh, so that's going to be the government. The government's going to provide those kind of things through business parks where there's no business rates, and then also something called um, uh, sort of capital allowances. So we, if you invest let's say in a big machine, then you can write off 100% of it against your profit straight away uh, rather than over time. Um, there's talk of the idea that in, in areas of high unemployment, you know, there might be lower in, in, in income tax rates. That'll never work. Um, that one's not that, one, that one won't happen. Um, mainly because it'll break down in the public sector. Uh, but so, yeah, government here and the government's an external uh, stakeholder to the company. Okay, so we've got our code of ethics here. So we've got our five. So we've got open, 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 the, the code of ethics here. And uh, let's see, we've got. Oh, oh, just going to set that off the scale. Let's just slide back. Where are we? Yeah. So AAT's code of professional ethics for accounting technicians uh, lists five fundamental principles in here. So there are five. Are five. Um, you know, uh, fundamental principles of ethics: integrity, objectivity, professional competence, and due care confidentiality and professional behavior so let's see what we've got here well confidentiality sat within that one so they that was that was in there that's one of them honesty no 
that's that's how you have integrity. You have to be honest to be having integrity, but that's not as part of the integrity one. So the integrity one is the other one. Now, long we've seen professional is professional behaviour is in there. That's one and competence and due care is the other. So they smush together um, two of the ethics into here to try and get them on a story. This one here is confidentiality and integrity. Just simply memorise them. Uh, in uh, the five ones, uh, integrity, confidentiality, professional competence and due care, um, objectivity and professional behaviour. Okay, so those are our five. Okie dokie. Let's get this back down to... Right, so Firoz. Ooh, okay, Firoz is an AAT member working the finance function of a local business. On Friday afternoon, he's asked to help with processing the final payment run of the week. Okay, he notices a large payment with no receipt, recipient named. Oh, okay. When he checks the invoice, he notices there's a handwritten and unable to read the signature on it. Okay, so we shouldn't be reprocessing this. The payment's been authorised by the finance director, who's a qualified accountant. Okay, so what? Um, the Firo squares this with his manager, and she says that these payments are often made to local suppliers. It's well known. He should just process the payment, run as it's fine, and everyone wants to get home. Oh, gosh, right. Okay, so we've got some uh, some advocacy risk going on from the uh, from the manager here, really. Um, and we've got some, you know, well, I mean, really, I mean, we've got some question, questionable objectivity going on here because, you know, are we being objective because it's Friday, we all want to go at home? Are we behaving with integrity in here? Um, questionable. All right, let's get into our questions. All right, excellent. As a qualified accountant, the finance director will always act with integrity. No, the finance director could be a crook, um, although it's very rare for professional accountants to act, uh, to, to act without integrity. Uh, it is very rare and it makes you know, makes good headlines really in terms of if, if accounts are, are crooks um, uh, then um, no there's, there's 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 a few of them that um, so very very rare in terms of uh, the reality of, of, of life really we, we have that sort of you know, on the one hand you have it drilled into you uh, and from when you're training and on the other hand you've got a lot to lose so no, not really so finance actors do tend to act with integrity but not will always so again we come up with this idea of you know, these very sort of hundred percent statements or we'd be wary of those ones that's a false no the, the, the finance director could be a crook um as it's friday for us it should complete the run as quickly as possible as it's been signed so it must be correct Ooh, no so what um it's friday there's a threat to so Feroz's objectivity because everybody's just saying let's get ourselves home in here um but he's not happy about it why should Feroz sign his name to it? if the manager wants to come down and do the do the payment run themselves the manager can knock themselves out and come down and do the payment run themselves but i don't think Feroz should do it and um, mainly because if it goes wrong remember the segregation of duties here Feroz is doing one thing the manager's doing the other the finance director's doing the other if it all just follows exactly what the manager sort of says, there's no segregation of duties in here. You know, be courteous, uh, but should just all down to go stick it. Uh, for us, should complete the run, but leave out the invoice to investigate it further on Monday. Yes, that would be the right thing to do, uh, really. Complete the run, because you can't hold up everything, but yeah, leave that one out um, in there until somebody agrees it. And then it would be a question, really, you know, we're now sort of into, into a bit of whistleblowing land, really, if we're being, being truthful. And where are we? We've got another, there's another question, so I'm sitting in here. Um, okay, so that's that's that one. Oh, right. And now there is an extra question which I've, I've missed off in here. Um, it says identify two actions that, that Faraz could take from the following list, which would be check that all payments have been made. Well, so what? Uh, that doesn't make any difference. Contact the head of finance to discuss the issue. So that would be a good plan. Uh, you know, there's a finance director, there'll probably be a head of finance and there'll be, you know, for us, his manager. So contact the head of finance and discuss the issue, you know, what's, you know, and explain the situation. Go home, his manager's left, so it's too late to change anything. Well, that's a possibility. Let's see what else happens. Send an email marked urgent to his manager to inform him of what actions he's taken. Well, yes, I mean, clearly to send, send it to his manager to say, this is what I've done. And here, and so I would go contact the head of finance and to discuss the issue and send an email marked urgent to the manager to inform her of what, what what actually is taken now what happens in real life well in real life i suppose there's a lot of pressure on Firoz here who's, who's quite a sort of low level um staff member uh, you know producing the, the information but but what would but so what um you know in terms of the situation well, what's the worst they're going to do well they're going to say for us you know you won't help us as a crook uh, and uh, uh and help us to sort of do this this um this payment incorrectly uh, so we're gonna fire you, you know, for a start that's a good one for an employment tribunal uh, and, uh, and secondly your Firoz will get a job 
elsewhere perfectly well. So um, never really worth. Uh, you know, you can, you can't, you can't ever have your integrity taken away from you. You have to, you have to give it away, and you can only lose it once. Uh, so no, Firaz is quite, quite right here. Uh, be conscientious at all times. Obviously, be very courteous. <coughs> um, and don't tell somebody to stick it. But in reality, you know the, the, that's how we would go about it. So that's the answer to that question. Task four. This task was about processing bookkeeping transactions and communicating information. So in this one, we're going to get down back into introduction to bookkeeping, and also as well principles of bookkeeping uh, controls. And so we, we need to really have a very strong knowledge of those two those two units because you can see this is 22 marks in here. We're going to re revisit those those two units um, and try and get as well um, all the marks uh, possible in here. Uh, because this is going to be the one place in the in the in this assessment where we can get 100% uh, to be able to give us a bit of a cushion against anything else. So let's crack on. Uh, so we're working as an accounts clerk for Natural Pet People, and we've got um, a company site trading into January. So we're selling animal food, and we've got a small customer base. Okay, we've got a sale. So here's an invoice, and as we go through the invoice, we can see that we've got term here, a term. So we've got, got term here, 30 days. So we're going to be in credits. We're on credit then, and if we're on credit, we can go through the sales daybook. Uh, oh, and there we are. There's a question identify which book daybook the transaction will be recorded to. So, sales and credit go into the sales daybook, uh, purchase and credit go into the purchase daybook, uh, cash sales uh, would be cash sales and cash purchases will be in the VAT or in the, in the cash book, and there is no such thing as a VAT variable. Um, okay, so I select the customer reference for pet parade coding. So, this is a, a coding uh, question in here. Uh, so our codes are alpha and alphanumeric codes. We've got the first two letters, it looks like. Yeah, so AS, FP, AS. The first two letters, and then we've got some numbers afterwards to tell us the numbers after. We've got, uh, this one's Pet Parade Co, so it'd be PP, and it would be the third PP, because we've already got two PPs already. So it'd be PP003. So that one's going to be PP003. Put that one. So what we go into there would be PP03. Right. This invoice has been manually recorded in the in, there's a 6,330 6, net in the daybook. VAT has been manually recorded as 1266. Total in the daybook for May has been posted to the general ledger. So uh, what should what uh, it's always really when you've got an error, okay, because what, what we got, we've got an error, what have we got to do? Yeah. Identify where each of the following accounts in the general ledger will be debited or credited to correct the error in the day box. We've got an error and we've got a what will be a net difference journal being posted. So we're not going to reverse the journal and then post the correct journal. Uh, it looks like identify the which the following accounts in general ledger will be debited or credited to correct the error. So it's going to be the com combination of both. So to do a net difference one, we've got to go um, what what should we have posted? And what have we posted? Let me make that a bit bigger because that's a bit small, isn't it? Uh, let me make that one a bit bigger. This is the country. Right. Should and have. Okay, so we've got net VAT gross. Um, actually, oh, sure, we should have gone sales, VAT, and trade receivables. And let me put that there as well to be net VAT gross. And make those all that a lot bigger. Oh, okay. So we should have posted the net ones six three zero zero, and we it says we posted six three three zero, and we should have posted. Let's just see. Did they give, did they give us any? No, nope, they didn't bother to give us the VAT figure, but we know that it's twenty percent. So that would be that times my two. That's the VAT figure, and this is the gross figure here. And we have posted 6330 1226. 
net in the day book, that VAT is that, and the totals have been posted generally in the job. Okay, so we've posted the totals as well. So let's go back here. So we posted 1266 and the total. So that's what we have posted. Okay. So we would have gone credit sales. And so we're going to credit sales with that. Um, we should have gone that. So we're going to go debit sales. Debit sales. And um, debit and sales 30. We should have gone credit uh, VAT control account um, 12260. We have gone that. So we'll be going debit VAT control account. Six. And we should have posted 7560 debit. Uh, trade receivables 7560 and we've gone 7596 we're going to go credit trade receivables uh, 36 now so that's what we've gone yeah, now let's go through and see what it is that they've things that we've got here Ooh, slide around so the sales number was was uh, we, we we posted too much in the credit side so we're gonna have to debit that the receivables we posted too much in the debit side we're gonna have to credit that and the vat control account we posted too much in the credit side so we're gonna have to debit that now in this one just remember in here they said that the day the day book totaled so they didn't put an error in it like where well let's say um the thing didn't you know the, the net and the vat didn't didn't add up to the gross quite easily could have put the put the net and the vat not adding up to the gross figure and so you know not a question of just going well yeah you know they over they overstated uh, the sales and the VAT and therefore the receivables would be um, overstated as well and therefore be you know having to be credited rather than debited. Could have easily understated the, the receivables um, the receivables in the in the answer. Uh, you know if they would have added something on on here somewhere that, that, that the trade receivables have been posted as let's say seven thousand two hundred or whatever, um, then you could have you know been going debit a lot. So just be a bit mindful of that. The way we should answer that question is is what should have been posted what have you posted and then you do the correction for that one okay so state four benefits of using an online accounting system and you see now we're now into a written question so this is great so what we're going to do in a written question is people sort of tend to struggle with, with getting started in a written question so what we have then is state and we're going to explain and we're going to extend and we've got upsides and we've got downsides and that gives us a nice little box of six sort of different types of things to be thinking about really in here so the state four benefits of using an online client system so um well um in terms of an online system uh an online system will be uh, electronic rather than manual Stated it from that, that point of view. So, I know an online system being electronic rather than manual. Uh, let me make this a little bit bigger as well. Uh, okay, online system. So, uh, upside is going to be is going to be save time. And how is it going to save time? Well, let's no, no, so, I've got some, I've seen, I've some statements. Here. How is it going to save time? Well, uh, it's going to reconcile reconcile uh, the control accounts. Ledgers. So I'm going to go control accounts. Control accounts for uh, trade receivables and payables to ledgers. Okay, I could upload upload uh, bank statements. And what's the explanation of that? Well, um, I could then code the bank statement. the chance of error um, now if we look remember back in the introduction to bookkeeping um, bookkeeping or you know I hated uh, recurring uh, entries uh, you know, for, for um, especially for uh, income and expenditure they were a terrible idea you would never use them but the examiner loves them um, so we're gonna we're gonna say we could uh, could process Recurring entries, um, and I'm also going to say, um, all right, so now I'm going to also as well in this one we've got in this thing here as well. 
uh, it has a nice thing here. If you remember in the introduction to bookkeeping uh, unit, I give what the examiner thinks are the great plan of, of online accounting systems, uh, and then I give what they are in reality. What, what does it really work? You know, so I give like two sort of sets of things, and this is where that actually comes into play, um, because what we can now do is we have any other relevant points that could be awarded, awarded marks, anything else that makes sense. Or, so it, it provides, provides data in electronic format, and so that can be used to obey reports. reports. And then we've got other things like uh, less chance of error uh, because it's going to automatically um, transfer uh, figures to accounts without their chance of transposition errors. There is, and it's going to automatically create our our um, travance. Which is going to sort of extract extract the data from data from ledgers. Right. So we've got state and explain, and we can extend. Now I say upsides and downsides. Well, here we've got you know benefits of online accounting systems, so they're always always uh, upsides. Um, downsides, well, you know, in terms of we're sort of saying, well, what are the benefits? There's no damage. Don't, don't ask for the downsides here. Um, um, so we've got that, and that, that sort of gets us going really. Um, so we've got automatic reconciled accounts, um, automatic trade transactions, um, other ones, uh, automatic transfer things from the books of prime entry into our into our accounts. That would be another one uh, that, would, that would sit in there. Um, and we're done reducing the chance of errors and omissions. Um, notice as well, remember the examiner sort of said on, on electronic um, accounting systems, um, you know, reduces the chance of error, doesn't eliminate the chance of error. I don't say that. But I think that, um, what else would we also have? Um, automatically balances the cash book, we probably would be in there as well. Um, those kind of automatically sort of balances our, any kind of our day books and some more up, up there. So we've got, we've got that kind of thing now. Um, so what we have happen is you can sort of state stuff and you can explain it and that sort of, that sort of gets you going a bit really uh, in our things. But we've got a ton of, ton of various things there. Um, you know, uh, the other things in terms of reports, I've got to create reports in there. The other things that I could possibly go for, um, I could link to other systems. So I could link if I'm if I'm sort of saying online. If we've gone online here. I could link to link to other systems. Other systems uh, uh, work across different departments. Departments managers could get their reports uh, at the desk. Now, in reality, when I sort of said what was the real uh, reasons for these things versus what the examiner sort of saying, actually uh, having data in electronic format, uh, you know, the speeding up of, of, of posting and, and transferring, and managers being able to have things at their desk, and um, also as well being able to work at different, you know, having different offices uh, working on the same thing, um, also as well manuals versus. Uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, sort of account electronic versus manual you know it's easier for the department to actually run uh, need less we need also they'll need less skilled staff members uh, so those were all, all answers there um, and what is quite I'm quite pleased about is that uh, the sort of chapter that I put in for introduction to bookkeeping controls on this sort of section really here which is missing from the other other books um, is really sort of coming into play in this this kind of question I think the examiner will, will be asking this a lot really this kind of these kind of benefits that seem to like it um, and I think that's going to be a big hole in the other in the other books. Um, interesting to see how the how the cheaters sort of uh, fill that in. Right. Um, when Pet Parade paid an invoice, they only paid uh, that amount there. So five, six, seven, all, and the other accounts off because as the other applies offer a prompt payment discount. All right, so we've got prompt payment discount. They assume this was industry practice. Oh yeah, really? Did they? Uh, you've not agreed that prompt payment discount, but Vanders decided to honor this occasion and allow Pet Parade a 10% discount. Right, so what we've got then is we've got, um, uh, so we're gonna go debit discounts allowed. And we're gonna go credit uh, trade receivables and also going to be going debit the VAT that we don't have to pay right
right. Okay, so what do we have then here? Um, oh, okay. I was going to set up and start doing the actual actual journal there, but we don't need to do that. Uh, right. Okay. Receivables, ledger control. Then, so we've gone credit and receivables, ledger control. Uh, discounts received, no impact. We wouldn't have that. It's not a discount received. It's a discount allowed. Discounts allowed. Debit discount allowed. And debit the VAT control account. So why was why was it though as well? Uh, the we've got pet parade company is not going to pay this much so it's a reduction in a money in item and the reduction in money in item is a credit um, now that's less money available for the shareholders um, but also you know we don't have to pay the VAT over to HMRC on this on this discount because you know, we're not getting that money in now so we've redu effectively we've reduced the price so we're going to have a reduction in the money out item to HMRC so that's going to be a debit and the amount that's left over well, that's a reduction in the amount that's left over for uh, shareholders. You know, they, they've got to pay this uh, this expense here because it's a reduction in you know, shareholders are a money out item because of the business entity concept. They are separate to the company. They are a liability to the company. And as a consequence, they are a debit. Chapter six of introduction to bookkeeping controls. If you're struggling with that, that concept, um, you know, that, that's the, the key point. Right. OK. Um, which one of the following documents will need to be issued uh, as a result of giving the discount? Always love this question because it's not technically correct. Um, uh, it is a credit note in this one here. You actually don't necessarily. Let's have a look. Let's have a look at our invoice. What did they? What did they put on this invoice here? Uh, right at the top, wasn't it? Okay. If this invoice would have had VAT is payable on uh, on amounts paid, then it, we wouldn't have had to issue a credit note. Um, but as it is, it's not got it on it, so we would we'd have to issue a credit note. Yeah. It's always going to be have to issue a credit note um, because that's what the examiner likes. There, uh, it's not you don't technically have technically right, it's a bit, bit, bit advanced to be sort of um, going down that that sort of VAT legislation. So uh, we're going to go credit note for that one because uh, we've got to reduce the amount that, that we're paying uh, that, that um, this company's going to pay. Is also we've got to reduce the amount of VAT. So we need to sort of uh, get our VAT down, right. And now we're into a situation where Van has asked you to write to the client advising them that the discount will be honored on this occasion. And ensure that they understand that prompt payment uh, discounts will not be available in future orders, right. So let's first of all, start with our writing. Uh, well, let's actually, we're gonna go state on a explain, explain, extend. And we got ups, uh, we did that twice, and we got our upside and downside. So this is our, our look framework. Upside and our downside. Okay, that's the first thing here. Well, let's just get that, that in. Ooh. Actually, let's make all of that bigger. Okay, and the other thing as well we've got here is going to write. So we're going to write to them, Ooh, and, and who am I supposed to write to? Let's have a look now. Does it tell me who the person is? Natural pet people. Uh, okay. And does it tell me who the person is? And the reason why I'll get into the in a second. All right. Okay. All right, so we're going to write, and we're going to be going for. Uh, we'll need our. We'll need our. Um, we need to sort of start off, don't we, with uh, their address, and then sort of their name, their address, our address, right? Okay, and date. That would be how our letter would look. Uh, then we're going to have a re, and this is. Uh, Payment of da, 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 whenever. Okay, right. And oh, hang on, let's go. That was after actually. To be fair, it was next. Uh, the next thing goes dear. Right now, um, I couldn't see anywhere in this the name. But if let's say if we go, let's go name. So if we actually given them their name, we would be going kind regards. Because you look upon them kindly. If we were dear, um, Mister. Or Mrs. on their surname, then we're going to go sin yours sincerely. And what yours sincerely means is, it is, is in this one here, oh, 
just put that in there. So yours sincerely. Right now, in um, with I go, dear Michael, and um, that I look upon Michael kindly. Uh, I know I know Michael, and I'm looking at him kindly. So I'm giving you kind regards. If it's dear Mr. Norton. I don't, we're quite contractual. And your sincerely is from the Latin sinicera, which means without wax. So when Greeks used to sell Romans um, statues or pots, and I'm making that out of, let's say I'm making that marble statue, and I sort of, unfortunately, the arm sort of drops off as I'm tinking my way along, and there, it's a big expensive piece of marble. And the issue that you have with that then is you sort of stick it together with a big lump of wax, and you sort of, you know, see if you get away with it. That statue goes and wings its way across from you know Athens or whatever, gets into some Roman villa, gets a bit hot, uh, the wax melts and the arm drops off. Or alternatively, um, you know, I, I make a pot and the pot's got a hole in and I fill it with a lump of wax and there and then somebody puts something hot in the pot and it all leaks out because the wax melts. Now, what you sort of say in terms of a, as a Greek to a Roman uh, is you say, well, no, it's without wax, it's sinusera. And so this is, uh, I am without wax, uh, I can contract with you. And so that's what yours sincerely means. It means you are without wax. Now, if it is dear sir or dear sir stroke madam, I don't even have a clue who you are. And so if I, I am, I'm gonna have to write in faith it's going to get to uh, wherever it's going to go, so that's going to be yours faithfully. Okay, so that's Mark. You know, um, so that's a bit uh, in terms of um, we've got sort of uh, I've gone name and the address, and I've gone the appropriate greeting. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of sort of either a dear whoever. I, can't, I don't think I could find a, a name. I could go dear. I can't really go dear um, dear Mr or Mrs. So I could find that one either. If I could find a name in the in the in the question, uh, I would use those ones. Um, Oh, I'm going to go dear sir, stroke, stroke madam. Um, I could go to whom it may concern, that might be a bit, a bit, a bit, it's a bit more off, off -handed. Um So, with the name, kind regards, uh, dear Mr. Norton, uh, yours sincerely, and dear sir, stroke madam, yours faithfully, I'm writing in faith. Uh, so, that's where we are. Uh, now, uh, now I'm into state, uh, explain, and whatever. So, state, um, you deducted. Discount. Right now, um, we do not offer that. Not offer that, and we did not bring it into, and and did not uh, build that into the price. Well, I said this We did not offer. We did not offer that. That really in here. Um, now let's extend it. Why? Well, what's the issue here? Well, we did not. We did not build it into the price. Build it into price. And it's not our and it's not our standard practice. Now, upside downside. Upside, we could tell them to go do one, um, and we'll, we'll have the money. Yeah, thank you very much. And there, downside that we might lose the business. So let's go and extend that further over here. And a downside one, and go um, here on this occasion. We will honour it. Yeah, I think that's a statement, really, isn't it? So we're going to state that here, um, because we value your custom. Um, and so that's what we're going to do there. Uh, what else did it say? Right, um, what does she sort of say? Um, not really. Okay, so but we'll but we'll not be able to do that in future orders. Okay. And not on future orders. Okay, looks. Um, so you can see how we sort of built up our marks here because we're going statement. And what I think a lot of people tend to do is they tend to not make the statement. You know, in terms of just what's happened, what's the question. Uh, then you then tend to not explain it, or you then not extend it. So somewhere along the line, people aren't going to state, explain, extend. So you think, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. There, just sort of six marks sort of uh, floating through, um, quite nicely, really. And um, you could sort of the other things. You know, we're going to issue you with a credit note now. Um, you know, we, we just, you know, we'll, we'll accept that in full payment. Um, all those kind of things are added, all, added all on. But that's how you build up your marks, really, in terms of that thing of, you know, if you want to try and work out how you're going to get going, really. 
um, and I've closed it off with my correct, you know, kind regards, yours sincerely or yours faithfully, really. Um, what else am I going to do there on that one? Uh, go, thank you for your receipt of payments, somewhere along the line, something like that. Um, anyway, that's how we that's how we build up and hoover up marks on the on the written question. Uh, I think that's 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 the whole of that one. So that's the whole of task four. Task five. So task five is about control accounts, reconciliations, and using journals to correct accounts. So what this is then is uh, principles of bookkeeping controls unit. We've got uh, some reconciliations of ledgers. I think we're probably going to see some control accounts, maybe, maybe some sense accounts. Let's see what happens. Uh, so number one here, we've got uh, all right, so space, etc. Let's well, posters. It posters. Here's its trade receivables uh, ledger. Here, so this is the, the backing ledger showing all the accounts. And so I'm probably going to reconcile that to a control account. So if the receivables ledger and control account, receivables ledger control account, so there's the receivables, trade receivables control account in the general ledger, and the receivables ledger, you know, the sales ledger, reconcile, what would be the debit balance? So the debit balance, we don't have any amounts old from these customers so we're not like the normal ones where we're in, we're in principles of bookkeeper controls where they put a credit balance somewhere along the lines here and the amount that's going to be the balance is going to be the total amount here so uh, that would have been posted to sales that's posted to the VAT control account and this would have been uh, into the trade receivables control account so let's let's create it 480.87 uh, 7789.67 and 973.45 now in in the exam what you would do is you would add up all three columns and then check them Against one another, okay, so that's that's how that's what you would you would do in in real life or in the exam. Uh, let me just as well format that so that it's to two decimal places, isn't it? Uh, anyway, let's to our two here. So that's what we are. Uh, four one four two six point three five in the exam. I mean, that is the right answer. In the exam, check uh, you would total the VAT and you would total the net, and you add those two together and just check that was the right answer because clearly you can make a mistake here, and uh, that's just exam technique. Right. The balance on the receivables ledger control account, yeah, so this is the sales ledger, the receivables ledger, whatever you want to call it, um, and the balance on the control account in the general ledger is 40.585.5.70. So the difference is 8.40 and 65 pence. Okay, so that's our difference for that answer there. So we know we got a difference, so we got an error, uh, because they should always reconcile. Identify whether or not the following statements. So what what you do in, in this one is is you go, um, what what's the impact of whatever the journal is on the sales ledger? You then reverse it, and so the balance is reversed, and you see if it's the same once you reversed it. So let's have a see what we've got here. So in the first one we've got um, a customer who's in credit having overpaid on a previous bill has not been included in the list of customers. All right, okay, so, um, and what we do is we, we, we put an amount in there. So a customer is in credit having overpaid on the previous bill has not been included in the list of customers. So that would be a credit on there. So um, credit and then so we would, we would, the impact is is that we've avoided a debt we've, we've basically got higher debit so the impact is we've got higher debit in there and and if you want to sort of um so you just sort of create an, an amount really you start off with the with the figure and then you take that off it so we're going to reverse this that's that and that gets us the figure so that could be the answer so that would be may explain the difference and then a discount allowed was recorded on the debit side of the customer's account in the receiver's ledger. So um, start with what the balance is. What happened? Well, we, we recorded a discount allowed, which should be a credit sort of side, which should be a credit credit element of it. We recorded it on the debit side. So the impact of that was to, to, to debit an amount, uh, twice the amount, actually. Uh, oh, on the credit. Uh, oh. 
divide it by two, and we're going to reverse that twice. Actually, you know, the impact would be would be just that, isn't it? So we've got a debit rather than credit, essentially. So we're going to reverse that, take it out, reverse it, and it's the same the same figure. So that's how you, that's how you do it. You put in what the you know, the, the trade, you know, the sales ledger balance is. You put the impact of what's been decided in this thing here. So instead of going debit, we went credit. So we we had debited essentially, and then you reverse it. You know, so instead we now we now credit it. When it was debit, we now credit it. And does the does it now equal the same balance? In here, this is a question where they're not given figures. So I tend to put figures in there just so that I can sort of see what happens. Sometimes you might have, and um, I think in the practice for the principles of bookkeeping control, I sort of set questions where I give two, do give like the same reason but different balances to see whether you're sort of picking up on the fact that you know, there's a credit balance within the within the um, the sales ledger, uh, or, or alternatively just to see whether, whether you know, instead of you like use the Osborne attempt where you just sort of you know memorise the whole list of reasons rather than actually sort of working out the calculations, uh, which the examiner will resort to in, in the end. Um, yeah, so that's how that's how you do it and make sure that you, you come up with a number and, and, and reverse it. Right. Okay. So cash book at the end of June shows a debit balance of eight three three two one one, and the following differences have been entered. Oh. All right, we mentioned balance, back cash book, and we mentioned balance statement, which means we're going to be into a bank reconciliation. We've got the four-step four method in here. Um, right, so we've got the bank statements including some direct debits. All right, so basically that's that's, that's step step three, where we're sort of adjusting the cash book. Uh, here, and then the cash book here. That's got, when, you're, when you've got things in the cash book that aren't in the bank statement, those go into the bank reconciliation. Okay, right. So we're going to create an adjusted cash book. So we've got our balance before corrections, debit and our credit. And so we're starting off with debit 8332.18, our unadjusted cash book. And we're going to go through what we've got here. So the bank statement includes some direct debits that are not included within the cash book. So a direct debit is a payment out. Uh, they are, so credit 187.12 and credit 67. Okay, and the cash book includes a check that is issued to suppliers, so that's an unpresented check that will be in the bank reconciliation. And the bank has charged 12 the interest 12 pounds worth of bank charges. Okay, so 12 pounds worth of bank charges are going in as well. Um, and the cash book includes a customer receipt, so uh, uh, an outstanding lodgement um, of 102. £102. So that's going to go on the bank reconciliation. So uh, our, our balance then is going to be to our T accounts. That's our carry forward balance. Uh, 8066. And let me just put those. And then the reason why you do T accounts like that, oh, that's annoying. Uh, okay, so we're going to do your T accounts like this, is that you then re-add re re it, re it together. Okay, let's put this all back to our double, um, our two decimal places. There we go. Right, so that's the balance. 108. The 8066 and 6 pence. Now you see here where I set up a, 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 a T account, I did a slight tweak in the in the carry forward things, and that's almost like how you would do it in real life, old school, um, where you just sort of try to make sure your addition is absolutely perfect because a, an error was was um, was, was you know, a bit of a disaster really. And uh, so that's how I used to do it to make sure when I did it in real life 30 years ago uh, to get it bang on. So that's our buns. Uh, and what you can see here is we had a we had a set of things that were just the cash book and then other things that were uh, going into bank reconciliation. Are we going to see a bank reconciliation down here and there? No, they just left us the items. And so that was a nice little trick there by the examiner really. It was going to sort of hang you out and see whether you would you adjust for all the things even though these are these are in the bank statement. Uh, sorry, these, these things in the cash book are just simply things that haven't hit the bank statement yet and wouldn't be and already in the cash book. So. Well done, examiner. It's exciting. Um, right, a new computer was purchased for long-term use in the business. It's been debited to 
repairs and maintenance. So it's an error. It's an error of principle. Um, but let me just explain how you find an error of principle. You have assets equals equals liabilities and plus capital. Counting equation. Not assets minus liabilities equals capital. That's a statement of financial position um, and is wrong. Um, uh, and the reason why that's that's the right um, account equation was it makes a nice T account. Um, so now, how do you know whether this is a, a, an error of principle or not? Really? So what should have happened was is we should have put it into here. So we should have gone debit here. Okay. Debit asset. And we didn't debit asset, we debited the capital account instead. Right, which was a capital shareholder capital in there, and repairs and maintenance is a profit and loss account in the year that hasn't quite been shuffled off to shareholders' funds, but essentially it's shareholders' funds. These are these are expenses and income of shareholders' funds accounts. So we put it in that one, uh, we put it in that one, we should have put it in that one, we broke and we went across these assets, liabilities, and capital here. If you were in the same thing, so instead of going it into into um, into uh, the computer, we put it into vans. We were still in the assets, and so it wouldn't have been a wouldn't have been a fundamental breach of accounting of accounting function. It wouldn't have been an error. It would have been an error of commission rather than an error of principle. But this one is an error of principle because we've gone and broken across it, and that's the easy way to find whether it's an error of principle. If it's not an error of principle, it's an error of commission where we're simply posting to the wrong account. Okay, in terms of the other ones, error of mission is missing from the mission from the accounts. Error of commission, not an error of principle, where we're posting to the wrong account. A compensating error would be where we've got two journals that uh, whose debits and credits don't add up, but combined, they, uh, the debits and credits uh, tally uh, are the same. Really. Identify the impact on the suspense account for correcting this error. So an error of principle, we went debit asset, credit bank, let's say, and, oh sorry, we went debit, cap, debit expense, credit bank, and we should have gone debit asset credit bank. Uh, there's no effect at all on on the uh, on the balance sheet here because our our journal still balanced, and none of those errors create a difference in the trial balance. So that was that's you know, the question that, that happened. And is that it for that? And that is that for this question. Okay, so taxes. So we got some some law here. Now we open up with contract law. It sort of says about contract law, principles of contract law. It's not actually about uh, contract law at all at all it's about the english legal system this so um it sort of says that and it says contract law in the syllabus um which would make it which would narrow it down significantly but it's actually not it's it's, it's a lot of the english legal system in here uh, fortunately the questions aren't that hard um so identify when the following statements are true relating to criminal or civil law so criminal law deals with the state against individuals with the purposes of punishment um you know punishment uh, in there civil law is between you know uh, sort of individuals with the purposes of restitution not punishment punishment is an american uh, approach when it comes to civil law uh, that they have uh, you know, things like punitive damages to punish the the wrongdoer we do not have punitive damages within within the english legal system about civil law english civil law is about returning people to the same point or to deliver fairness and uh, criminal law is about breaching uh, criminal law, you know, uh, laws which are about breaching laws against society, essentially, and about punishment. So, cases are dealt with in the county court, right? So this is the lower lower court, really in, in here, the county court, and the lower court for criminal law is magistrates, and the lower court for civil law is county court. The burden of proof lies with the prosecution, right? So there's a prosecution for a start there. Uh, and the prosecution is in the criminal law. Okay? Uh, within the civil law, the burden of so within the uh, criminal law, it's beyond reasonable doubts. You know, because you're going to put somebody, you know, potentially put somebody in prison, or you're going to give them a criminal record. The the burden of proof lies, um, you know, beyond reasonable doubt, and therefore it relies with the prosecution to prove uh, you know, the, um, guilt beyond reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt, not 100%. Uh, but in a, in, a, in, a, in a criminal case, the defendant does not have to prove anything. It's the prosecution that has to you know, prove, uh, you know, prove that, that, that um, things are beyond reasonable doubt. In a civil case, 
it's the burden of proof is only be, only on the balance of probabilities. So so both both the claimant and the defender, so uh, the defendant uh, here. So prosecution versus claimant, uh, and both of them are defendants uh, in terms of the defence. Uh, so the burden of proof is is um, on the balance of probabilities. So 50-50, you know, which, which which side does it which side does it sort of land on, really? And so there is no burden of proof there within between the claimant and the defendant in the civil law. So. That's the answer for that one. Uh, nice, nice little opening between between uh, you know, criminal and civil law. Pretty easy as well, that one. Um, identify with the following situations create a binding contract. So to create a binding contract, we need to have offer. We have an you know, offer uh, acceptance, really, and we also need consideration. Uh, so you and a friend each buy a lottery ticket, okay, and agree to equally share winnings if either wins. All right. So do we have offer? Um, well. Um, you might agree it, you know. do we have acceptance, well you've agreed it, but do we have consideration? And you don't really, you've just sort of agreed this sort of thing, you haven't like each bought part of the lottery ticket, you know, each of the other one's lottery ticket, so you haven't, you haven't got a consideration there, so you've not got a contract. So that is more of a promise. And so just in terms of this idea of, of, of consideration, um, basically, is it something that you're actually giving something over for, something of material gain uh, for, for each you know, either party, material gain, material loss, um, or is it a question of just a bit of a promise? You know, I could say to you, I promise you that I will, you know, complete whatever book in the future. Um, you know, and you might go, I'm going to buy that book, um, and then, but if I don't, I'm only just promising you, you haven't actually given me any money for it yet, whatever, then I'm not going to, um, you know, you actually can't hold me to it, even though I complete all in the full time. Um, you are the last person to raise your hand during an auction before the auctioneer's hammer hits the table. So, you have offer, you've made an offer, you've raised your hand, the auctioneer has accepted your offer by whacking the gavel down, in there, and so that has created a binding contract, there is offer and there is acceptance and there is consideration. You send an email to confirm that you want to buy a car that you saw in your local garage. So, has the has the local garage made an offer? They've put together a price, but they own, but you. This is what's known as an invitation to treat. What they've done is they've invited you to make an offer of acceptance, you know, an, an offer to them, but they actually haven't accepted it. So this is this is where where you have prices, let's say, in a shop. You know, and the prices are all out in the, in, the, in the shelves. That's an invitation to treat. The actual offer and acceptance only happens at the till. So let's say that they got it wrong in the pricing. You put it through the till, and then they say, oh, no, no, it's not that price. It was this price over here, which is a higher price. You can't go, ha-ha, but you offered it, and I've accepted it, and therefore it's a contract. No, that's just an invitation to treat. And the same way as here, the, the, e the, the, the car price you saw in the local garage was an invitation to treat. It was not an offer. Uh, so in actual fact what's happened in this email is that you have given an offer to buy the car for that The garage now has to accept that offer uh, in order for it to be a binding contract Okay You enter into contract to buy goods, but the contract is breached. Ooh This has caused you to lose money and you would like to make a claim against the, se against the seller. Okay, that's fair enough If a breach of contract foreseeably causes economic loss, so foreseeable economic loss right and that's the point is it if you have a foreseeable economic loss then you can claim for that okay damages will generally compensate for that loss yes they will yeah, so they, they will so it has to be foreseeable if it's a question that it wasn't foreseeable so let's and the, the, the way in which the case law that this uh, it's, it's a basically a washing machine isn't isn't like installed and as a consequence somebody loses out a business loses out on their normal profit, but they got this really big offer, a big contract that was available, and they wanted to sue for the big contract as well. And they said no, because that was a new thing and it wasn't foreseeable. Uh, so um, in here, foreseeable economic loss, damages will generally compensate for that loss. Yes, they will, provided that there aren't any limitations within the contract that limit, limit uh, losses. And typically, uh, contracts include limitations for the loss of, you know, they, they, don't, they don't extend to, to profit, losses of profit. Um, but you know, if there's not one, that's not in the, in the not, that clause isn't in the contract, which it wouldn't be AAT level two. Uh, we can, can we can have compensation for the loss. If the but remember, foreseeable, not foreseeable, not not possible. If the contract states the amount of damage payable, if the contract is breached, this will always be the amount paid. Now notice here, will always. We've got our little alert alert register going on here. Will always is not always. Now 
If I so, we went back to the original part where I was saying uh, the civil law in the English legal system is not designed to be punitive, it's not designed to reach penalties. So let's say you and I uh, you know, make a contract and I decide to put in this really high penalty uh, in it so that you, 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 um, don't, you perform the contract. And the, and the intention of that penalty is to intimidate you to, to, to do that, that contract really. You must then do it because you'll make a huge loss otherwise. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a punitive penalty clause and it's not enforceable. Um, I can only enforce penalty clauses, uh, which is you know, an amount of damage you'll pay if you breach the contract, or that are equal to a loss that I can prove that has actually incur occurred. Uh, so um, now one of the ones where, where you sort of tend to have that one is uh, somebody who's tried to say, well, you can't sue me for, um, for uh, you know, parking illegally in your car park and charging me the sort of £85 uh, of parking fee and they said well actually yeah because that was all the cost it, it, it sort of took to sort of dissuade people from parking illegally and uh, writing the letters and doing all the various sort of cameras that we have to put in there and the judge actually upheld the, the parking fee so in this one it's false because it will not it won't always be the amount paid because it might be unfair it actually has to be the amount of loss that is incurred so that's the end of our law question which is quite nice Task 7. So task 7 is about bookkeeping systems. Uh, so we're going to sort of see what we've got there. All data security includes... Uh, so Marco is running a small marketing business, two members of staff, John and Juanita. And they all visit clients and make sure there's always one person in the office at all time. Marco has one computer with all three staff members use. The password is... Oh, right, okay. This is, the password is very easy. So it's easy for everyone to remember. State three risks of the business. Um, okay, so we've got some nice, nice... So we're going to state... And we explain and we expand. So we're just going to explain and we expand just to be able to get it, get what we're, what we're up to here. So the um, state three risks in there. So um, it's a simple password word, uh, because it's you know one, two, three, four, five, six, and we expanded it. So um, could easily be broken by someone else who access the system. System, okay. Um, right. Everyone has access uh, because there's just one password. There's just one password. And let's go through what happens there though. Um, so you can't track, can't track who is doing what. So it's easy for a fraud, and also as well, uh, there could be GDPR, uh, uh, GDPR sort of data breaches, data breaches. Um, yeah, um, and, and, and access to sensitive information. Let's say. Okay. Right. So. Um, so that would, that, that would be pretty much it. And so in terms of just how to get going with those those kind of things here, though, that kind of state, state what the question is, explain what it means, and then just explain what, what the consequences of it. Um, that sort of makes it uh, easier. We're in risks here, so we've got no, we're all downsides, we're not going upsides. Uh, so everybody has access to it. So I've gone through one, two, three, four. So I've got four risks there, four risks there. So, okay, I've, 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 I've given four, and, you know, and I'm going to get three, and then I think I've covered all the points in the answer. Marco does not really know whether the business has done well until the accounts are prepared at the end of each year. Well, that's not great. Uh, he would like to understand how the business is doing throughout the year and perhaps be able to set targets for John and Juanita. Ex identify useful uh, characteristics of useful information that's missing from uh, Marco's current system. So, what we really want then in terms of in terms of our uh, sort of financial systems, you know, it's got to be it's got to be reliable. So, I mean, this is these are the AAT sort of terms. So let's go back in the good old good old days of you know, 29 years ago, Michael's. Uh, just becoming a, a, or a trained to be a chart accountant. Uh, how did this go for him? Uh, it was accurate, you know, so accurate, you know, reliable. And that is that not only is are things correct, but also they're complete. 
as well. That's what's reliable really sort of means. Are, are they are they you know, posted correctly, but also are they, is it a complete system? So that's no, it's not that because we're accurate and we're complete. We are posting it and we are posting everything. Consistent um, is comparability, you know, so it's consistent so we can then compare it to things. And there's, a number's not really much use, otherwise it's just a big number, uh, unless it can be actually compared to something really. Um, understandable relevance is what it used to what it used to be in a while ago there so it's, it's relevant to, uh, to the thing so understandable is one thing and we can all understand everything really within a given enough time relevance is the depth to which the point is is sort of made really because you know we collate our figures into accounts and we can collate, collate accounts into sort of lines within it within, within financial statements so uh, is, is it understandable is it relevant to the, to the point of the issue no, nope, we've got all of those three covered, but what we don't have, because we don't do it until the end of the year, is it's not timely. So things happen and we don't get to do anything about it because we only find out about it against the year. So the answer to this one is we are missing timeliness because we're not producing our, our management accounts on, a, on, let's say, a monthly basis. Identify which of the following types of information will be most useful to market to achieve his goal of setting targets for John and Juanita. OK, so uh, and what we sort of said really is we're going to set targets, all right? This one's a question I think you just have to roll with it. You know, it's one of those ones which, you know, you're trying to pick out ones. That, let's just cancel off things that aren't, you know, targets for you know, John. Because it's sort of, let's just go back to the answer up here, or the, 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 the opening bit here. Um, just sort of, what do they do here? He runs a small marketing business, two staff members of staff, right? And they all visit clients. There's always one person in the office at all times. So he's running a small marketing business, but it doesn't actually say what each what John and Juanita do. Um, so they could do anything really. So it's not really the greatest of things. Um, he wants to set targets in here, and targets are budgets really. So it's budgetary information. But you know, in those targets, it could have been sales invoices as well. And the only reason why it's not sales invoices because it would be a sales report. Um, and then eventually control information about stock. You know, now one could say, well, John's the stock manager, so you know, or a production manager, but actually, they're it's marketing, so they don't really have that. So it's not that, then taxation information is irrelevant. So, really, those two are relevant, relevant here. And it's between budgetary information and sales invoices. And um, because sales invoices are not a sales report, and that's budgetary information, it's budgetary information, but it's not a great question that one, really. Um, and that I think is all right. Okay, and then we've got another another part to it. Let's keep going here. Marco is considering moving to a cloud-based accounting system. So, what a cloud-based accounting system is? It's hosted software, uh, hosted by a, you know, a, a, a software provider. Really, they put all the software in a great big sort of uh, server somewhere in a nuclear bunker somewhere. That, that there's, there's, you know, I don't know if somebody says nuclear weapon taken out, or whatever, and sort of a nice big hole or a or a um, or a sort of an X mine or something like that, which keeps it nice and cool. Uh, and we sort of stuff the the, uh, the data into that. Uh, big advantages of cloud-based systems. Um, you know, you're not managing uh, servers. Typically, they've got better better security and and um, also as well. Uh, you know, you can sort of link it into other software uh, so that it sort of works. Uh, you know, and you can sort of get better reports out and that kind of stuff. Really, so uh, more integration between that type of software and and just your know, a, a sort of a server sitting in in somebody's office. Right. So. Um, He's been told this will automatically complete the transfer of data from the books of prime entry to the, to the ledgers. Well, well yeah, I mean, to be fair, um, a lot of things automatically transfer the data from the books of prime entry to the ledgers, marvellous. Uh, and it automatically gives the transfer of data into control accounts, yes, yeah, so that's just like, these are just digital accounting systems. And it will all automatically reconcile the payables and receivables ledger to the respective control accounts. These are, that's just a digital accounting system. Marco does not understand what this means. Okay. The difference between a manual and a digital. So, it's, right, so really, what we just explained was there was nothing to we had the cloud bit, but there was nothing to do about cloud so far. Um, manual versus digital. Digital. Uh, so, manuals handwritten, handwritten, written with a chance of error. Uh, describe the differences. Chance of error. Error. Um, you know, amounts need to be. Uh, you know, Transposition to accounts in the general ledger, general ledger, and uh, transposition to uh, subsidiary ledgers. And it says mention uh, so transposition. Right, so the transposition of the day books, day books to accounts, and transpositions uh, to. Uh, 
day box to the sub ledgers. Okay. Uh, and then we need to reconcile. We need to manually reconcile. Reconcile. Control S. And the digital one will. So in terms of our digital system in there, um, when we record, let's say the sale, the yeah, primary. They're automatically transferred. Transferred. And they're automatically transferred to the general ledger accounts, the subsidiary accounts in there. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you type that that stuff out. Uh, so they're automatically transferred to the, to the general ledgers and the subsidiary accounts, and they automatically reconcile. Reconcile. Does not eliminate the chance of error. Eliminates Ooh, element. Hmm, not. Chance of error. What does eliminate chance of addition and transposition errors? And it also is faster and saves time always get that in whenever you get anything like that one um, so let's go through let's get up our account I think we've covered everything in that one really um, right so we've done that marvellous um, we've, what was it it's five marks for this one in here I've explained what's going on with the manual sort of side I'm just what goes on the digital side I've got yeah, the app hit all the points I've probably, probably scored it for good I could, um, oh, actually, I'm looking at the marking scheme and it says there's three marks for manual, three marks for digital, and I've gone way and I've covered all the points actually in there. So I did well on that one. Um, so congratulations there by me. Uh, so yeah, I scored, I scored all the marks. Um, so I scored eight out, of, uh, eight out of five. Right. Um, that's the end of that, that question, I think. Taskgate. So Taskgate is about the external business environment. Uh, oh, we've got a few few questions here. 14 marks. Okay. Global Limited expanded their business to take advantage of opportunities in countries other than the UK. They want to make sure they increase the process. Identify a statement that explains the meaning of globalization. So globalization is you know trade across the world, uh, really. Um, so buying goods from an overseas customer. Possible. Um, Operating internationally at all levels of the business, yeah, that's a good, that's a good one there. Means employing staff members from different countries. I mean, globalization has impacts on staff members from different countries, but, but very much it sort of feels like, like number, you know, answer B there really. Uh, globalization means operating internationally at all levels of the business. So we're sort of, you know, it could be anything, couldn't it? It could be sales, it could be purchases, it could be, you know, getting the raw materials from a different, a different country. Um, and, it, and it could be your employing staff members as well. So, so really, those two are part of it, but close that, but but weren't the full thing. And it's probably it's B, but it's a bit of a naff question. Uh, right, okay. Uh, identify with the following statements about risk and risk business business and risk are true or false. So, risk versus reward is the fundamental. Um, uh, you know, reason for, for business really, you know, is we want to make sure that we get back a better reward for the risk that we take and risk is in terms of liquidity, how liquid is the is our assets, you know, and how quickly we can get our money out and how quickly we can get out of it, uh, get out of any, any kind of things or barriers to entry, barriers to exit and then the general market that, is, uh, uh, that that thing operates in, you know, electricity, um, supply, uh, used to actually be incredibly ridic or ridiculously sort of uh, straightforward and very limited sort of risk that might be a bit more exciting since the uh, since the cost of living crisis and the invasion of Ukraine uh, you know versus you know the internet so a business only exists to make profit and see when we see words only you know, always red flags there really um, no businesses can exist to, to not make profit I mean they could exist because they you know they're, they're a philanthropic exercise so that's not true that's a that's a false false thing there 
Um, businesses take risk to make profit. Well, yes, they do. Risk versus reward. And instead of stuffing the money in the, under their mattress at the bed, the, the entrepreneur sort of uh, you know, invests and they take those risks to make profit. That's the point of it. Uncertainty means the same as risk. Hmm. Um, well, it does really, um, but the answer says it's not uh, for that one, really. And I think this is one of the greatest of questions, that one, really. I think that's, that's you only want to sort of saying in the, in the fullness of you know, the thing that roll with some of this, this stuff, really. Um, the certainty removes risk. So uncertainty must be definitely, mean, I mean, it doesn't mean the same, but, you know, it's sort of like, it's just... Yeah. yeah, I think in the purpose for the purposes of actually corporate finance, it would it would really in there because it's talking about the, you know, we talk about the difference of risk risk reward, but at level two AT it doesn't um, stuff it. Let's move on on from that one. Um, identifying the statement which explains what happens when there's deflation. So deflation is is the reduction in prices. Uh, so you know, normally we have inflation, um, and when we have deflation, you know, price, price, you know, prices go down. Now it's often considered a bad thing, deflation, uh, because it sort of reduces uh, investor confidence. Everybody gets really, really upset and unhappy and whatever. So uh, it's great. So interest rates keep rising. Well, there's no reason for that. Um, there's a sort of different things. In fact, to be fair, when you have deflation, uh, usually bank, you know, the central bank panics a little bit and wants to increase. You know, always wants to have this idea of a little bit of inflation, but not, not too much inflation. So to do that, you reduce you reduce interest rates. Prices fall temporarily. There's deflation, so prices fall. Uh, but is it temporary? Well, no, because it was deflated. It's deflated, you know. If it hadn't, hadn't, if it was temporary, then it would be inflated back up. So there wouldn't be deflation. So by definition, it can't be that one. The value of money increases continually. So the value of money is what I can buy for it. So if I got a pound, and let's say you know yesterday I could buy two bananas with it, with that pound, uh, very expensive bananas, but still there we are. And there's deflation, so so now I can buy three bananas with that pound. By definition, that, that that money can buy me an additional banana. It's worth, it's worth one more banana. So so the value of money has increased in there. So so it is C is that one, and rather than those two there. Hmm, economics with an economics question anyway. Um, identify whether the following statements are likely to cause an increase or right oh an increase in demand for a luxury product. So a luxury product is one where where um, the more money that I if I have more money then I will buy the luxury product. If I have less money, I will not buy the luxury product because I'll have to buy, you know, I want to you know, spend my money on essentials. So we have things like essentials and we have luxury products. So there is a general increase now. So I think, oh, there we go, in increase. So I've got more more money. We've, we've spent our money on essentials. We've, we've, we've heated and, and lit the house and we've had our food. And now we've got some money left over. So we go and buy a, a, a holiday, really. And the holiday that we buy is, is like a really nice one in, in the Caribbean or somewhere. Uh, rather than a you know a, you know a camping holiday somewhere in the you know somewhere cold, uh, the cost of raw materials to make the product is reduced. Right, so if we reduce the cost, so the cost of raw materials is reduced, in there so. Um, that has no impact really on it. I mean, this luxury product is just cheaper to to produce now. No, not really. No, there's no increase in that one. There's no no no, no increase at all. So that, that doesn't make make an impact really. Um, theoretically possible, I think with gift and goods that actually will reduce it, but we'll just avoid that. Uh, it's just too too um too high, high in that one. And the average price of products of products increases. So the, if the average price of product increases, and that won't increase it because let's say the average price of products increases and our household income stayed the same. So we're now spending more on our essentials. We've got less and less over from the luxury goods, so it wouldn't have been no increase. In fact, you know, what, what do we go into, what, put, let's say, a reduction in here and see whether you would have gone for a reduction. Um, government is concerned about the rise in employment, unemployment in young people. They have a number of options they can take, but have communicated to the public they will not be increasing rates of tax. Mm, okay. Um, identify a statement of what what tax is. Okay. Financial charge made by a business. No, that's not a tax. It's a financial contribution made by government to the business. No, that's a subsidy. And a financial charge made by the government. Uh, so that is what tax is. So tax. No. The government going and taking money off off either businesses or or, or individuals. Or applying it to goods and you know and effectively taking off individuals that way. Right. 
No, so identify when the following taxes are direct or indirect. So a direct tax is, is applied to directly to the um, to the sort of the, 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 the individual. An indirect one is, is applied indirectly in there. So um, just to go through there, corporation tax is applied directly to a company. Uh, VAT is applied indirectly in there. So it's an indirect tax. So it's applied to um, you know, so it's applied to a, a, a sort of sale and then is collected by the the, uh, the the supplier and then handed over to the government. So it's an indirect tax. National insurance applied directly to, to um, you know, employees' wages. Either employers or employees' national insurance. Alright, okay. Two principles of an effective tax system. Alright, so in terms of our effective tax system, I mean, we're talking about effective now here. Um, there's two things about effective tax system. One in terms of it's efficient to collect, and the other one is that it's fair and seen to be fair. And so we used to have a system, um, you know, a fair you know, focus on, on fair taxation. That sort of broke down a bit under Gordon Brown, really, in, in, in sort of New Labour, where, where he very much wanted to, to get as much money as possible to invest in, in public services. And so we introduced the notion of stealth taxes. Um, you know, we didn't used to have things like double taxation. Um, of this, it used to be sort of fairness, really. So this is quite an out, out of date question, if I'm being truthful. Um, we used to have fairness, like you couldn't tax the same income twice. So let's say if a pension, you know, if you invested in a company uh, for your pension, when the company made dividends, you had a little sort of amount that you got back that went into your pension pot because you were going to be taxed on that income later on when you were you received your pension. So you would have it, you'd be taxed on income tax. That got removed. So we'll tax corporation tax and, and uh, we're taxing the corporation tax and then we'll tax them again through income tax. Uh, so you get these sort of things out of double taxation systems. Now you've got things like, um, you know, the typical one of, of, of equity is a, is a progressive taxation system. So, you know, you should, as you get more money, uh, your your effective rate of tax should increase as a proportion uh, of your money because you know you've got more disposable disposable income left. But we still but we have the quirk where between the income of a hundred thousand and a hundred and twenty five thousand, the taxation rate is is sixty percent. Uh, whereas after one hundred twenty five thousand, the taxation rate is forty percent. Uh, so it's not actually a progression taxation system anymore. And so um, one would like to say. <laughs> you could sort of say hey, he's having a go at the uh, at the UK taxation system since for every chance listening to Gordon Brown, um, but um, yeah, it's, it should be equity and it should be fair, um, but uh, stealth taxation has come in and, and sort of had a go at. That. But let's say the the, the the recent sort of mini budget um, from Trust and Kazi Kartang, you know what you can sort of see is well we'll reduce your uh, income tax by one percent by by a penny. And then we'll go from 20% to 19 19 but what we'll do is we'll freeze all of the personal uh, the personal allowances uh, so although inflation's going up by 10 let's say inflation goes up by 10% um, and your wages go up by 10% as a core so your wages go up by 1.9% we'll take 1% off but actually we'll charge you an extra 1.9% so actually everybody's behind it bit of an interesting one that it wasn't picked up um, when they were having the, the initial debate across there because clearly it was a um, you know just a, another stealth, stealth taxation really um, and then a couple of weeks later what we sort of see in the papers is it's like well hang on uh, they sort of uh, gonna get us with a lot more tax um, than anything that was given back uh, because you know we just throw its personal allowances and in the face of a massive wave of inflation. So I think that's for my moaning about um, the inequities of the of the current taxation system as a as a chartered accountant. Uh, so one's economy got to be got to be practical to be able to collect it, and, that, and the other one is uh, equity in terms of got to be got to be seen as fair. Typically, equity comes along as the, the idea of a progressive taxation system. Really, um, you know, in this economy. It's also a part of sympathy, really. Um, you see, uh, ease and empathy are sort of, you know, they're, they're the same words for these kind of things here, but it's economy and equity anyway. I think that's it. Uh, so that's the end of the assessment. So what did we see see on, on this one? Well, well you know, in the, if the, in the initial uh, one, uh, we sort of, I said, you know, there's going to be some questions where you're just going to have to roll with it. I think there were four probably four marks, like right? the whole hundred marks where you'd sort of say, well, actually, you can roll with that, really, and just, you know, not entirely sure whether the, whether the answers are really right or wrong. Um, a lot of uh, written questions where we had to sort of get going, didn't we, with, with state, explain, and extend. 
and that, that gets us going and also hoovers up the marks. A little bit of top and tailing in terms of, let's say, letters and then your know, uh, dear whatever and uh, your know, yours sincerely or kind regards or yours faithfully. Um, then we have a lot of uh, principles of bookkeeping controls really, and also the introduction to bookkeeping, uh, introduction to bookkeeping um, you know, which we need to be good at, and in there as well, we had uh, you know we had two digital accounting digital accounting questions, didn't we? You know, in terms of uh, two digital accounting questions in this assessment, we'll see in the other assessment whether they follow the same thing. But I think that's a big thing from the from the examiner, and that's going to be interesting because it's missing from the traditional books uh, on introduction to bookkeeping. Um, in mine, because um, I thought the examiner would go with it, so I'm quite chuffed with it, in which I'll sort of do that a bit really. Um, but I think that's going to be an interesting point for the exams coming up. Uh, in the first round of the business environment uh, you know, assessments because I couldn't see it beyond uh, just a series of bullet points um, for you know, what the examiners put in the syllabus rather than any kind of explanation and what we had in the answers remember, was, was marks for any, any sensible answers and so I was quite chuffed actually in terms of the way in which I've done I think it's chapter 16 in the introduction to bookkeeping book where I go well look this is what the examiner says uh, but also there's all this other stuff as well that the examiner hasn't sort of said that would probably earn marks if you chucked it in and actually as the, as the it has earned marks as we chucked it in uh, really um, a bit of law as we're going through not that hard uh, we just need to sort of understand the, the, the general sort of uh, principles of, of, of law really uh, um, enjoy your law it's quite fun um, and, and that was and that was it really. Um, you know, and we had a bit of corporate social responsibility as well, which was pretty straightforward. So that's the end of end of this assessment. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's an interesting one because I don't think with the grounding of of introduction to bookkeeping or principles of bookkeeping controls that there'll be a sufficient uh, you'll have the sufficient um, numbers and you know, or scores there to be able to uh, be successful in this in this uh, unit, and that's really why it has such a low low success rate when it's the business synoptic in 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 the 2016 figures. Um, and I write the book specifically to hoover up the marks in those sections. And then in terms of the written sort of side, uh, first time that account, you know, you'll have seen to have to write like an accountant. And I don't think anybody explains that in terms of, you know, the state explain, extend, bullet pointy kind of approach, really, um, that gets it, that gets you going and gets the marks. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, good luck with your studies. And we'll see you on the next assessment, next book or whatever the next video is.